Hi, I want to welcome everybody to the first episode of HBR Quarantine. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Adi Ignatius, the editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review, and my co-host is Josh Macht, who heads product and innovation. Josh, welcome. Uh, thanks, Adi. It's uh, great to be kicking off the show. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. We, uh, we've launched this show. We know that millions of our, of our uh, followers, our readers, our fans are at home, have been at home for weeks. This is week seven for us working from home. So we wanted to create a program for you um, that really gets into the big issues of the day, COVID-19 and the fallout and how it's affecting business, how it's affecting work, how it's affecting the, the search for talent, how it's affecting um, our lives. We have a special guest uh, this week, Thomas Friedman, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times will be here. We'll have a conversation with him in just a moment. We also are gonna take your questions so if you put questions in the comment box, we will uh, try to get to those. But Josh, before we start, I just, uh, you know, I want to ask you, week seven quarantine, you know, how are you surviving and how are you, how are you getting your work done? Yeah, well, we're getting work done, which is good. I mean, we're definitely adjusting. It's been a couple of months and I mean, it's feeling more like the marathon part of this is kicking in a marathon that we were never really prepared to run, but we're adjusting. And um, I don't know, there, there are moments, you know, I had a beer with someone this weekend, we were, you know, six, eight feet apart. There are moments where you almost feel like a new normal or something, but definitely strange. What about you, Adi? What are you, how are you, how are you keeping sane? Yeah, it's strange. I, I go through cycles, I guess, emotional. I mean, I, I, in some ways we've never been busier and, and, you know, we are fortunate enough to be in a business where we can move remotely and, and get most things done, but it's really personally, what do you do? I mean, I, you know, my wife and I are playing gin rummy and keeping score and we're up to, you know, 500,000 points. I'm doing 30 crossword puzzles a week. Uh, I am experimenting with new recipes for squirrel and neighbor's house cat. I mean, they're just, there's <laughs> ways that, that you keep going. You definitely um, got me going on the crossword puzzle thing. I've, tried, I've actually now really tried that and I am a little bit hooked. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great time waste. It's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you some links. Um, just to say quickly, I mean, Josh and I worked together at Time Magazine. Um, Josh was one of the first editors of uh, the time.com website when none of the rest of us could figure out what in the world digital was. He was an early pioneer. He and I have innovated since then, um, tried to bring innovation to Harvard Business Review. That's sort of what we're doing today uh, with a, a new innovation that we hope will be will be useful for people. They always told us we should not be on TV, but I think yeah. we may have found a loophole here. So we're going to try <laughs> to drive a truck right through that. This is definitely a beta. There's no question about that. And uh, we're thankful that our guest has come along with us as well. But I think we're going to learn a lot quickly and uh, definitely hope we have uh, a conversation that people can be a part of. All right. So let's let's get into it. I Before we bring on Tom, I want to show uh, a, a quick TikTok clip. It's sort of a meme about, you know, what it is when you're uh, when you're working at home and maybe your spouse is not working at home and you're both sort of driving each other crazy. So producer Dave, hit that clip. You know, that feeling. <laughs> Is that, which role would you play there, Adi? Or maybe, or maybe that's for Dave uh, DeUlia, our, our producer. Maybe, maybe we can see him too. Say hi, producer Dave. Hey, how are you? Hello. Which role would you be? I think I'd be the uh, one in the fat suit, and I wouldn't need a costume. <laughs> this is funny. The trope, the trope is that we, you know, that the, the talent insults the producers, but you're just you're just jumping right in and insulting yourself. I'll, 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 I'll take it where I can get it. All right. So let's 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 go to our conversation. We have Tom Friedman uh, uh, waiting to join us, and uh, there's a lot we want to ask him. Again, if you have questions for Tom as well, put them in the comment box. But Tom, let's start. You know, what is your life like now? How are you? You know, we think of you as a as a globe trotting uh, correspondent. How? What's your life like now? Where are you? How are you able to to get your work done? Well, our, our bureau. I work out of the Washington bureau normally, Adi and, and Josh. Hi to you, and great to be with you guys. First of all, thank you. Um, uh, so I normally work out of the um, excuse me Washington bureau. We've been closed for basically two months now. So I've been working at our home out of our home in Bethesda. 
Um, and I kind of go to work every morning by coming to my corner of the house and office. My wife, Ann, goes to hers. Uh, uh, some people may know my wife was just about to open a new uh, museum in Washington called Planet Word uh, uh, to promote reading, literacy, and love of language. We were all supposed to open May 31st. So she's been scrambling, you know, to deal with uh, those uh, adjustments for Planet Word. And um, for me, you know, uh, I, I'm, I've made the adjustment easily because through Zoom and, and through Skype and, and through LinkedIn and these systems, um, I can have conversations with people all over the world. Um, I'm doing webinars tomorrow with uh, some UN ambassadors, a group in India and a group in China all in one day. Um, and uh, the amount of travel that would have taken is um, is staggering to think about. It's not as good. It's about 85% as good, but but it's uh, it's 100% less uh, less stressful on me. So I'm I'm uh, I'm appreciating that. Um, after I work, we always have dinner together. Occasionally, do takeout from some of our favorite restaurants to help them out. And then every night, we watch an episode of Gilmore Girls, um, uh, which is a wonderful <laughs> show that my girls grew up on. It has seven seasons. 22 episodes each season. We're deep into season two now. And um, it's a wonderful show, if you haven't seen it, about relationships, love, uh, small town values, and it's the best antidote to COVID-19. Oh, we could have a whole show just talking about that, had I known, but we have so much to cover. That. That's like perfect. So yeah. if you just joined us. This is HBR Quarantine brought to you by Gilmore Girls. That's right, Gilmore Girls. That's really cool love. Um, well, so that's interesting. So, so obviously, most people, you know, or or many people, are not able to work from home, and and you know, it it kind of underlines some of the inequalities of of life, but inequalities that are exacerbated yeah. at the moment. Um, before I get to that, though, I, I let's focus then on 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 this life, the life that you lead, the life that we lead, the life that you know a lot of white collar people lead. You know, do we need to be in the office? I mean, is this is this sort of calling BS on the notion that we actually need to be present to to get work done? Well, I'll tell you, I, I really enjoy um, being in the newsroom of the New York Times. So uh, I'm in the back corner of the Washington bureau with my uh, friend and colleague Maureen Dowd, and um, uh, but all around us, um, you know, kind of uh, horseshoe are the are reporters, and I love walking around um, talking to reporters. I'm still a newsroom rat. I started as a reporter. I'm still a reporter at heart. And so I do miss that. Not that I can't call people on the phone and whatnot, but um, I like being in the company of, of news people in newsrooms. Uh, obviously, I miss going, touching, feeling, and the serendipitous things that happen when you travel. But, you know, even in the best of days, I, I worked at home probably 50% of the time, and I found it a quiet place to work, use the phone, et cetera. So, so for me, that part uh, isn't that um, big a deprivation. I'm curious, um, Tom, because you were you were pretty early on with your column talking about kind of the the balance of physical health versus economic health. Um, thought it was really interesting that you uh, did some things on Sandel early on, Professor Sandel. Thought all of that was great, and I just wonder how your and even today you're talking about it. So I just wonder how your uh, thoughts of that are evolving. So um, yeah, I I. Um you know, helped kick off that debate. It was really, I would say, the Wall Street Journal editorial on, on that Friday, and then um, myself and Dr. David Katz um, uh, on Saturday and Sunday really kicked this off of how do we find the right balance between saving lives and saving livelihoods? Because there's a lot of ways to die. You can die by COVID-19, and you can die a death of utter despair um, uh, from having lost your life savings, your job, your your business, and and we need to balance both. We need to, the goal needs to be total harm minimization. And that's been my theme from the very beginning. The debate, uh, it took about a couple of weeks, Josh, and then the debate just exploded. Um, and now it's it's everywhere. And I've basically used my time between then and now to really um, drill down on what I've found to be uh, the most helpful, thoughtful people in that discussion so I can really perfect, you know, uh, from my point of view, what I think, how I think about this. And if you look at the world today, Josh, you really see there, there are kind of three basic models out there. Um, the first is the Swedish model. They don't like to spell it out in so many words, but, but Sweden opted for herd immunity. Now, let me, let me just take a step back and, and just to remind people that um, they're only, there's only one way that nature has given us um, to uh, um, resist a pandemic virus, and that's 
by triggering our immune system. That's why nature gave us an immune system. And um, there's only two ways to develop immunity, either a vaccine uh, where we do it you know, medically, or um, we do it organically by developing the antibodies, by having the disease and developing the antibodies uh, in order to become immune from it. So Sweden basically said, we're gonna go for herd immunity. We're not gonna shut down our malls, shops, and restaurants. We're gonna tell people to limit their gatherings to 50 people, and we're gonna do our best to quarantine and protect the elderly, the most vulnerable and the most immune compromised. And we're basically gonna let the um, a disease go through the population. Um, and those who um, either uh, get it and become immune and get it and do not require hospitalization, um, they are betting will be less than uh, the number of hospital beds in the country. That's their bet. And it's 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 playing out. It, it's way too soon to say categorically one way or another. But I get up every morning and the first thing I click on is Sweden. Then I click on bet number two. I click on Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, China. There are various iterations of bet number two. Bet number two is, is super efficient um, uh, suppression and mitigation with super efficient tracing, tracking, uh, uh, and, and sequestering. Uh, super, super efficient at the Chinese end where they don't have to worry about civil liberties um, and just efficient at the New Zealand, Australia, Singapore end. And we see how they're doing. And what you see are various degrees of challenge there. Uh, New Zealand and Australia basically are saying we, we have completely suppressed, there's no new cases. Um, and my God, hats off to them for that. But let's just remember, they're doing that while keeping their countries completely sealed off. Um, all right. They, they, and and uh, China, too, they, they have brought the new cases down to near zero in Wuhan and, and, and other places. But they're doing that with incredibly intrusive tracking, tracing. I take your temperature. I test you. You've got the disease. You're not going home. You're going to, to a clinic and for 14 days, et cetera. So that's model number two. Model number three is Georgia. It's the United States of America. It's I'm tired of sitting at home. Um, I'm going to take my chances. Um, one day, maybe we'll catch up with tracking, tracing, um, uh, and quarantine, but um, uh, we're just going to do it um, uh, our own way. And I would tell you, I'm very worried about that approach, because if there's one thing I've learned, uh, and, and I learned this from David Katz, which is that if you don't respect this disease, it will kill either you or someone you love. And um, so uh, be very careful. So those are the three models. And I get up every morning and I see which model is doing best. So again, we're here with Tom Friedman of the New York Times. If you have questions that you would like to pose to him, put them in the comment box and we'll try to get it to uh, as many as we can of those soon. Um, you know, Tom, I read something like uh, VW is said on May 3rd, it's gonna open an auto plant in Chattanooga. I think it's 3,800 employees. Is that nuts? Well, let me go to 30,000 feet for a second, Adi, because um, one of the things that, that I have felt personally has helped me navigate this story is the fact that in 2008, I actually wrote a book about nature. It was called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Um, and it was really about our interaction with the natural world, globalization, um, and population. And so a lot of the people I got to know in working on that book have really been uh, very helpful teachers in this. So one of them is Rob Watson, who founded Green Buildings for um, Natural Resources Defense Council. And Rob likes to say that, always remember, Mother Nature is just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't talk her up. You can't talk her down. You can't say, Mother Nature, I'm tired of sitting at home. Or we're having a recession. Um, she's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And she always bats last. And she always bats a thousand. You do not mess with <laughs> OK, so I, I start with that principle. Um, and then the second thing I'd like to point out to people is the reason Trump got in trouble and was slow to respond. There are many reasons. And, I, and, and bashing Trump is shooting fish in a barrel. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But there's one thing that was really important in his failure of leadership. He thought if the market was going up early on, then he was succeeding against Mother Nature. Now, I'm a big believer that the two largest forces on the planet are the market and Mother Nature, um, uh, Mother Nature and Father Greed. But the market, at the end of the day, is no match for Mother Nature because Mother Nature, unlike the market, does not start her day at 930. She does not close at four and she does not take weekends off. 
So while Trump, actually, we have to remember this, it's one of the most remarkable events in this story. After his disastrous nationwide speech and the market collapsed, and then the next day he took some steps and the market soared, I think 2,000 points, he actually autographed a chart of the market's ascent that day and sent it to Lou Dobbs of Fox Business News. And that knucklehead played it on the displayed it on the evening news. Now, while Trump and Dobbs were doing that, Mother Nature was silently, inexorably, exponentially, and mercilessly spreading COVID-19 throughout our society. So if you don't understand her inexorable nature, she is going to kill you or someone you love. There is only there are only two ways to become immune a vaccine and herd immunity. And if we don't respect that, um, uh, whether you're called VW or you're called New Zealand, um, she will make you pay. And um, so I, I have great respect for her. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the real misapplied um, uh, phrases in this thing is we're at war. Okay. Um, we're at war. And Trump says, I'm a wartime president. Well, when you're fighting another collection of human beings, when we were at war with the Nazis and the Japanese, we could outmanufacture and outmobilize them. When we were at war with the Soviet Union, we could outinnovate and out in, and outspend them. But when you are at war with Mother Nature, there's only one way to to th to survive an encounter with Mother Nature. Okay, what she says is, um, uh, it's not the strongest who survive me, it's not the smartest who survive me. It's the most adaptive who survived. That is the law of natural selection. And what she did give us over and above any other species, is she gave us a big brain to figure out how to adapt to, the, to, her, to her climate changes. And this is like a climate change. And if we don't use that big brain um, to adapt um, in a very strategic and coordinated way, because when you're up against her, if you are not humble, if you are not coordinated, uh, because her virus will find any crack and any opening, and if you are not utterly about chemistry, biology, and physics, because that's all she's about, she will absolutely kill you or someone you love. So let me let me go to, uh, we have a bunch of audience questions coming in. Let me go to one that, that really relates directly to what you were just talking about. And this is from Sophia in Los Angeles. And her question is, is herd immunity realistic? Isn't the virus constantly mutating? Uh, no, um, not so far. Um, uh, the, not to a degree that we have seen so far, like um, seasonal flus. And, um, and there's, a, there's a difference between drift and shift in terms of mutation that epidemiologists talk about. Um, uh, epidemic drift and uh, epigenic drift and epidemic shift. And so... Um, so far, we haven't seen um, uh, evidence of that that uh, suggests that herd immunity is not possible with this season's coronavirus. Interesting. <clears throat> you know, one other thing, Tom, as you talk about the environment, um, you know, it is interesting that right now we're almost giving the environment a little bit of a breather. We're not right. eating any fuel. We're not moving. Um, and people talk about it. People talk about it. You know, I, I'm an allergy sufferer, air pollutants, things like that that bother me that maybe I feel like, huh, it's interesting right now. I, I mean, are there things out of this that maybe, you know, are good about that, that we could even carry forward? Well, I think it's a really good question, John. You know, this is, of course, the warm up act for the big one and the big one's climate change. And there are two differences between uh, a pandemic and climate change. The first is um, uh, climate change doesn't peak. So if the Northland, if the Greenland Iceland, uh, if the Greenland ice shelf melts and the Antarctic ice shelf melts, they're gone. They will no longer reflect the sun's rays. The oceans will rise. They will be permanently boiled by the sun. And the second difference between pandemics and climate change is there's no herd immunity to climate change. There's just a relentless pounding on the herd. So if this isn't a wake up call to what is now a decade where we have to uh, uh, do everything we can to stay under two degrees rise average temperature um, by 2100 to, to if, we're, if we have any hope of managing what is now unavoidable and avoiding what will be unmanageable. If this isn't a wake up for that, uh, I, I really don't know 
what is. And you know, one of the things you you see, Josh, too, we've seen all um, how how minorities, particularly African Americans in our country, you know, have suffered woefully disproportionately um, from COVID nineteen. And one reason is, um, and there's been a lot of work done on this. Their neighborhoods are where people put power plants. They're where they, where they slice highways through. And they're uh, affected by a lot of these uh, uh, breathing asthmatic diseases, particularly childhood asthma, more than the general population in proportion. All right, I got another audience question. This is Heidi uh, in Seattle. Hello, Heidi in Seattle. Um, so we've, we've put you on the spot already as a, um, I mean, you're, you're a foreign affairs correspondent. We put you on the spot as a, as a science expert, as a, uh, a health expert, as a uh, domestic policy expert, and you do it all well. So. Now you're a business futurologist. What will the new normal look like, let's say, six months from now? Well, um, it's, it's a good timeline for the question, Adi, um, because who knows? You know, there's, there's the potential here for, uh, obviously, uh, you know, a black swan of a, of a cure, a therapy, or, or actually a vaccine coming earlier. That would change, obviously, everything. But let's assume that um, the predictions are right, that it will take 12 to 18 months at best to really have a vaccine. Um, the way I talk, t think about it, because again, we're opening a museum, uh, so we're thinking about this. What what is a museum in the uh, post lockdown world? Because there's a feeling like out there, right? Like now I've got a broken leg, but then as soon as this is over, I'm gonna, I'm going to run the sprint and relay again. No, no, no. You're going to go from a broken leg economy to a crutches economy. That is, whatever business you're in um, that serves the public, you have to imagine we're thinking about this for our museum. What is a museum like when everyone who comes in will be wearing a mask, wearing gloves, and have to stay six feet apart? That is true whether you're at VW plant. That's true whether you're in a restaurant. It's true whether you're at HBR. And so that's what I call the crutches economy. And, man, I'm glad the stock market's going up. Uh, I'd rather see that than it going down. But, um, you know, it's 15% below its highs. And I think it was Howard Marks who said the other day, the economy is not 15% off its high. You know, so there's some mismatch here. And I, I realize the stock market's looking ahead, but man, that's got really good vision if it's if it's seeing what what it's seeing. But maybe it's betting on a, a, a cure or therapy. I'm not a market prognostic. Well, either, but no, no, it does, something does feel really out of whack. I'm curious. Yeah. Adi and I talked a little bit ahead of time about, you know, asking you about strengths and weaknesses of our response. Um, and it makes me, I mean, I think we can see a lot of weaknesses, especially around the fact that we're just not federally coordinated the way we, we need to be. Are, do you see strengths of, 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 or pockets of it, at least, of what we're doing or re glimmers of hope, I guess I might be looking for? Yeah, you know, um, my macro view, Josh, is that I wrote a book with Michael Mandelbaum in 2011 called That Used to Be Us. How America Lost Its Way in the World It Invented and How We Can Come Back. And um, it was a book about um, the fact that, uh, you know, we can only be dumb as we want to be for so long. Um, and the fact is that um, there, when a pandemic hits like this, it tells you a lot about your immunity, tells you about a, a lot about the so level of social trust in your community. I live in a community that seems to have a lot of level of high level of social trust here in Montgomery County. We've had a lot of good leadership. It tells you about your what my friend Marina Gorbis calls your cognitive immunity. And I think one of the things that's really damaged America in the last decade, thanks to Rupert Murdoch and Fox News and social networks, is our cognitive immunity, our ability to sort out fact and fiction, falsehood. And when you're up against a scientific challenge and having a president who labels anything he doesn't like fake news, our cognitive immunity as a society has been seriously damaged and and at the worst possible time when we're up against a scientific challenge, you know. Um, and at the same time, um, our, our immunity to nature um, has been challenged because where did this virus come from? Uh, it comes from the fact that we have had a reckless development in urbanization that has destroyed ecosystems, that has killed the apex predators in these ecosystems, that has killed the iconic species and left behind what? The generalized species that can survive in destroyed ecosystems. They're called bats, rats, and primates. Um, and then we have societies and cultures, and Adi lived in one, um, that likes to uh, eat some of this wildlife. Uh, and hunt some of it for medicinal purposes, for sexual purposes, rhino horns, you know. That's why God invented Viagra, okay? Lay off the rhinos, okay? Um, 
but they hunt these wildlife, they mix them together in wet markets, and we get all these zoonotic diseases, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19, because they jump from these animals that developed and learned to live with these viruses uh, in their natural habitat. They, they co-evolved with them. Um, but once we take them out, put them together with humans, they jump. So this, this is not going to stop unless those practices of wet markets stop, but also that we don't think about protecting the ecosystems and their natural predators to these bats um, uh, uh, rats and, and um, primates that are can kill us in this world. Mm -hmm. So let me do, let's do one more audience question and then uh, Tom, I think we'll let you off the hook. But um, so this is from Scott from Emeryville, California. And it, it really tracks the question I was gonna ask, which is really, you know, how has the world changed? How is the world likely to change in a lasting way in terms of global interdependence? You know, as COVID-19 accelerated what we were already seeing in terms of nationalism, protectionism, xenophobia, you know, is the world, to use your term, is the world a little less flat? Yeah, so, um... Uh, I both laugh and cry when people ask me that question. I, I, I laugh because uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing webinars with people in India, people in China, and with the UN. People say, hey, Friedman, I guess the world isn't flat anymore. And I just want to say, uh, excuse me? Like, it has never been flatter than it is now. And um, this is a very important point because, you know, when I wrote, wrote The World is Flat, I basically said, guess what? Economists don't own the term globalization. So if you measure globalization purely by trade or even just by travel, um, yes, the world right now is, is, is less flat. If you measure it by the ability of individuals, companies, countries, and communities, but particularly individuals, to act globally, which is what the book was about, oh, it's flatter than ever and is gonna and is gonna continue to be. So it's gonna be a we're gonna get positive sides that are gonna actually draw make us more of an international community, more, more literally community, more intimately intertwined. And in other ways, it's going to slow down globalization because for sure, coming out of this, companies are not going to be building these long, unresilient supply chains. Um, there's going to be a lot more, I think, manufacturer brought home of key products and, and supply chain needs, and certainly a lot more 3D manufacturing. So I see that happening. But, you know, I'll tell you this, and this is just for me, maybe a final thought. I've been a journalist for 40 years now, Adi, and, and the, um, the columns and the news stories that I've written that I regret most all began with the phrase, the world will never be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Tom, if you can hang on, uh, our producer mm -hmm. Dave said this show needs segments. You have to have segments. So we're going to try a segment, uh, which is... Uh, uh, is it here today or is it here to stay? Um, and, and I'll sort of kick it off. And so, so let's talk about the phenomenon of live sports. Uh, there's very little of it now. There are you know, a couple of quote unquote rogue countries. I think Belarus is still doing live sports because I don't think they've changed a thing in how, um, how they're uh, uh, gathering together and what their policies are. Um, Taiwan baseball is existing now with cutouts of fans in the stands playing in front of nobody. I fear this is not a temporary phenomenon, that even though we will get back to work on some level, there'll still be risk. There's no on off switch. We're suddenly it's safe to go back to work. We'll try to mitigate the risk, but there will still be risk for a while. I'm not sure people are going to feel comfortable going to pack stadiums uh, to watch sports. We need sports. We love sports. You can do sports with cutouts of fans in the stands. I suspect that will be with us for quite a while. Josh, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think it probably is, but I do, I hear, uh, you know, professional athletes when they say that they thrive on having fans there. So I think there is a question and there's an adrenaline rush. I think, you know, um, I was seeing over the weekend baseball in Taiwan and other places like that in empty stadiums. And like you said, the cutouts, I do really wonder what that's going to be like. I feel like watching these things could be a little eerie, but I'm just not sure to your point, Adi, that we're going to be feeling comfortable getting back there for a while. Um, yeah. So, Tom, what's your what, what do you think is going to happen here? Yeah, I would not go to a baseball or football game um, until there's a vaccine. Um, or, or herd immunity. You know, I mean, I there'd have to be an all clear. I'm mm -hmm. 66, um, and I just, um, I'm in that, you know, borderline vulnerable group. And um, until there's an all clear, I'll be watching on TV. 
All right, so that was the end of a segment that may not even make it till next week. But there you go. <laughs> so anyway, so so if you just joined us, that can happen. Uh, this is HBR Quarantine. We will be, be with you um, every week at noon, uh, trying to address all these questions about when we'll go back to work and what it will look like. And with, with that, Josh, you want to take us out? I do. First of all, um, thank you very much uh, to our guest, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times. That was amazing and a great way for us to kick off the show. I also want to tell people that next week, we're um, next Monday, we're going to have Angela Duckworth, who's a University of Pennsylvania professor who wrote a best-selling book called Grit. She's going to come and talk with us a little bit about perseverance um, and resilience as uh, we continue to go through this very strange moment. And I want to thank, um, I've got to sort of roll the credits here and do it quickly, to Scott LaPierre, thank you, our senior producer, Dave DiUlio, who's our broadcast director, Karen Player for design, Kelsey uh, Grippenstraw of audience engagement, as well as production assistants from Ellie Honan, Dustin Brady, and Andy Robinson. Um, I want to also thank Oliver Ignatius for creating our theme song of Holy Fang Studios, which is great. And you can probably tell that he's the same name as my co-host and longtime friend. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We um, And thank you for your questions as well. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this show and we hope you have a great week. <laughs>